We have a new sound system tonight, so when you speak into the microphone, you need to press the button in order to the reverse of what we can. Welcome, everybody. Um, we call this uh, moving day. Um, this is the last meeting for several members of our board, myself including Ms. Zesma and Ms. Becker. Um, and I'll give the members a chance to say something as is history uh, at the end of the meeting. Um, but right now, we'll get right into the agenda. We have a few items to go through. I don't think this will be a particularly long meeting. The first item is uh, $121,000 over a three-year period for lighting electronics and software on a U.S. Coast Guard uh, inoperability hazmat detection and engine replacement for a fire boat. We have the fire chief here tonight. He'll step us through that. Item number two will be a transfer of one hundred and forty. $2,000 rounded to the Board of Education to help them with the cost related to the new maintenance facility. Item number three is about $11,000 from contingency uh, to the Registrar of Voters in anticipation of the, uh, the special elections that will need to be held as a result of the recent elections. Item number four, Mr. DeWitt is going to step us through uh, and his team will step us through the uh, Senior and Disabled Tax Relief Plan. Uh, Mr. DeWitt, I want to talk to you about that um, before we get there. Item number five is the minutes, uh, approval of the minutes. Um, if we get through number one early, I'm going to push the discussion on the Board of Education. They are detained in another meeting, and they asked if I can push that to later in the agenda, so if I have no problems from board members, we'll push number two uh, further down in the agenda. With that said, does any board member have any questions, comments? at this point in time. Seeing none, we'll go right to item number one. To here, consider an act upon the following resolution as recommended by the Board of Selectmen. Whereas it is in the best interest of the town of Fairfield to expend a total of $121,242 over a three-year period on lighting, electronics, and software for U.S. Coast Guard in interoperability, hazmat detection, and engine replacement for Fireboat Marine 228. $90,931.50 of said project cost to be funded by a grant available under the Federal Department of Homeland Security's Port Security Grant Program in 25% match from the Town of Fairfield, meaning $30,310.50. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Michael C. Tetro, first selectman, be and hereby is authorized to accept in the name of and on behalf of the Town of Fairfield a Federal Department of Homeland Security Port Security Grant in the amount of $90,931.50. And further resolve that the first selectman is hereby authorized on behalf, of the town, on behalf of the Town of Fairfield to sign and execute any and all necessary documents to secure said grant. And further resolve that $121,242 is hereby appropriated to fund said project cost. Do I have a motion to put that before us, Mr. McCullough? Second, we'll go with Mr. DeWitt. I did notice in this that by the time this gets to the RTM, we probably will have a new first select woman. So we should probably amend this to take out Mr. Petro's name. Is that correct? Yeah, and just insert select person. Okay. So I will make that amendment at the appropriate time. Chief, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you. And, and on a night that you have a short agenda, I win the lottery prize to come up first. When it's a very long agenda, I'm at the end of the agenda. I, you know, I just wanted to make that note. But that yes. was purposeful. Thank you. Thank you. I, <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, yes, we had an opportunity to apply for a federal grant. As you know, we pursue a number of grants every year. Uh, the Fire Act grant uh, for firefighting equipment and the Port Security grant uh, for our marine asset. And we were fortunate to uh, receive uh, uh, the grant award uh, and is a three-year performance period. We intend to delay some uh, the, the largest item, which is the replacement of the outboard motors to the third year, which is with the age of the motors. Um, if you recall, this was a fireboat that we acquired from the city of Bridgeport some years ago, uh, and when they upgraded uh, their fireboat, and it has served us very well. Uh, we will, in the first year, uh, replace the electronics so we can be interoperable with the Coast Guard. Uh, in the second year, we will replace uh, 
or, or acquire uh, the sea burn equipment, chemical, biological uh, uh, detection equipment, which is a, a requirement of the Coast Guard, and in the third year, the boat motor. Questions for the fire chief? Go with Ms. Marmion. Thank you. Um, so the, the addition of the CBRNE, we don't currently have that capability, that detection capability? That's correct. So does this represent a change in terms of how we're going to be using this boat? Are we, have we always been working with the Coast Guard with this boat, or does this represent a new relationship in terms of how we're working with this Coast Guard? This has been part of their uh, requirements for grant-funded equipment, and uh, when we acquired the boat uh, from Bridgeport, it did not come with it. Um, to have some land-based sea burn capability, and the Coast Guard is requesting all of their interoperable um, Long Island Sound partners have that capability consistent with our mission for uh, Coast Guard operations. Thank you. So I guess what I'm wondering is, is, is this going to change how our fire department uh, personnel uh, are used, or is it going to change our sort of our mission of what we're doing, or is it just staying the same, but we're being required to um, purchase this equipment in order to be uh, sort of interoperable? It is, uh, the best way to describe it is, um, one, we have this equipment for land-based operations, our hazmat team. We uh, have a number of members uh, on the department that are uh, certified hazmat techs. Uh, so we have that capability. We, uh, from time to time, uh, we use that equipment uh, to monitor atmospheres. Um, in uh, their, the Coast Guard mission for Long Island Sound and how they have supported local assets um, as Part of their overall command structure, uh, they have requested uh, that we build this capability into our Marine so that uh, if we are deployed, uh, we could be monitoring in real time uh, any potential threats uh, that might occur to uh, Long Island Town Ferry or other um, uh, boats transiting Long Island. Thank you, and thank you, Chief. I didn't know we were not interoperable with the Coast Guard. Is this in a mutual uh, aid capacity? Um, and up till now, not being interoperable with them, how do we interact with the Coast Guard? So we are in communication. So we have a great uh, communication system. Um, uh, they have upgraded their software for uh, their search and rescue operations. Uh, and they, uh, the expectation is that uh, uh, local marine assets uh, from municipalities operating on the same platform. Uh, so we're upgrading to the platform for search and rescue purposes. Uh, so we can see the same they're seeing uh, on the and, and that's the interoperable part of it. Uh, we are currently interoperable by uh, radio Thank you. Good evening, Chief. How long does the equipment last? So the, um, the electronics um, is subject to, uh, it, because it's in a, uh, the environment that is in, uh, subject to, you know, the salt exposure. Um, we do overhauls every year to make sure that uh, we're um, cleaning all of our equipment and uh, making sure that it's ready for operation in boat season. We do maintain a capability 365, except for those periods when we take it out of the water for, for that annual maintenance. Uh, the electronics, um, uh, for as long as that software is supported, um, you know, I would expect that somewhere between five and ten years uh, that uh, we would get uh, you know, regular updates to the software. Uh, but at some point, uh, the Coast Guard may change. Uh, but I think that this is a, a fairly long view. Uh, uh, you know, I would expect uh, that it, with this kind of investment, we'd get 10 years out of it. 
Uh, the boat motors, uh, we're getting uh, close to 12 years on the original motors, so I think we're doing pretty well on that. And we're projecting that we'll replace the outboards uh, at the end of the performance period, so we have another three years before that will occur. Okay, so you answered my second question, which was about the boat itself. You call it Marine 228? And how old is the boat, and how long do you think we'll, we'll have this particular boat, and is the equipment transferable? Yes. So if, you know, this is a, um, a boat that was... Uh, built in Kingston, Ontario uh, by Metalcraft, it's an aluminum hull, um, very durable. Uh, I expect that uh, we'll get a very long life out of this. It's not a fiberglass boat that uh, will degrade over time. Um, and uh, as I said, we do take uh, special precautions every year to make sure that we take it out of the water, uh, sorry about that, do a full service uh, on the boat uh, so that we extend its lifespan. Um, I don't anticipate, uh, and you haven't seen it in our uh, capital forecast in the waterfall, um, we do have a rigid hull inflatable uh, that we operate out of Southport uh, that is in the latter years of our uh, waterfall projection, uh, but not for this boat. So at least through the end of the next decade, I expect that this boat was service. So I would expect that they will have residual value and we'll work with the town to surplus them and um, the town will receive the benefit of the sale of those motors in a recreational set, a recreational function uh, they uh, will perform fairly well and we should get a reasonable return on that. I'd like to outline I certainly will. Yep. Anybody else? Mr. Becker. So the funds that are projected for this year, um, are you, I guess it's but uh, not getting done, you know, with the fact that you're going to allocate money, I mean, not too far into here at this point. So, how the year is looking right now, but obviously, you're taking a chunk that wasn't going to be allocated going to this, be able to meet the grant. And I guess the same thing applies like for next year, will you be asking for some additional to make sure that your normal operation is covered to be able to cover that? Count, fill that in. So we project that there will, in our apparatus maintenance account, uh, for this piece of apparatus, uh, it will be funded. We uh, we project that there will be enough funds in this year's budget to cover uh, $10,000 that uh, we had identified, or $10,000. We will include it in our operating budget capital for the next two years uh, for those items that appear in those years. Okay, thank you. Others? Chief, I got one. How often is the boat deployed on it? So I anticipated that question, um, and I produced uh, um, the uh, call records. Uh, we go out about a dozen, call, a dozen times a year uh, for life-threatening emergencies, and that's been our average for the past four years. So about 12 times a year, and they're all, what, drownings? Or, or have there been any fires? What, it, what have they there, been? There have been range from boater in distress, uh, boaters stranded, overturned sailboats, um, and medical emergencies, uh, and several drownings. And have been successful? The, having the boat has helped you get there more quickly, not relying on Bridgeport, not relying on port. How does that all work? How's that? How's it work? The other agents. Yeah. The 
because the Calvary can't get there, uh, uh, we treat uh, Long Island sound responses very differently. We do uh, land-based responses because of the limited support. Uh, we have a very robust marine group uh, that covers uh, the territory from Stratford to Greenwich. Uh, they all train together. Um, they meet uh, once a month under the Coast Guard's uh, purview uh, and uh, support each other's mission. Uh, we back each other up uh, when there is a call in Bridgeport or Stratford. Uh, Westport, we go as far as uh, the Westport Norwalk line uh, for mutual aid as they do to Fairfield. Um, and we uh, and the police department uh, work together uh, to support each other on that immediate response. Uh, so the system works very well uh, to provide the number of resources when you think of the complexity. You know, a, 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 a boat that you can see from shore that's stranded or floundering uh, is one thing, but when there are uh, calls for uh, missing persons or drowning, it takes uh, quite a few assets uh, to cover the area that's necessary uh, to conduct the search and perform the rescue. So for, the, for purposes of marine safety, it's almost been regionalized, and this group acts as a, wherever it is, everybody's got assets to that region, that there. Yes, and, and that was part of the Coast Guard's uh, goal when they established uh, support for local marine operations and grants became available in uh, somewhere around 2008, 2009, 2010. Uh, and uh, as they became leaner, um, they felt that they could, uh, in their quote, uh, quoted uh, position is buy down the risk, uh, invest in local communities uh, to build up local capacity. Uh, because they were not able to fill the mission to the same extent that they have in the past. Thank you. Questions of the chief? Jim, you gotta press the button. You have another boat that you keep on Reef Road Station, right? So we, no, that, that boat, uh, you've seen it there. Uh, we now keep it at Yee Yacht Yard. Um, it uh, is in, in the boating season. Uh, we keep that in the water because of the number of calls for service, particularly on the west side of the reef, uh, where there's such a long response time from uh, the marina uh, to get around to uh, Pequot Harbor and those beaches. Uh, so we keep that boat in the water um, at the hot yard uh, from beginning of May till just about now. So one of the reasons keeping a reef road was to respond to the reef calls, the numerous ones that you get right at the Penfield Reef, have it basically half a mile away. Response time on that. You have other vessels that you use for that? So we have Marine 228, the 28-foot uh, boat that uh, we're referring to here, the 17-foot rigid hull inflatable, uh, and we have a number of flat-bottom boats uh, that we have, and one is at uh, the Reef Road Firehouse. All right, thank you. Any other questions from board members? Anything from the public? Coming back to the board, I'm going to make one motion here. I'm going to make an motion that we amend this item to take out the uh, the name Michael C. Tetro because by the time this gets past the RTM, we'll have a new first select woman. And I would change the wording anywhere it says uh, the first selectman to say first select person for purposes of this um, item. Do I have a second to my motion? We Mrs. LeClaire with a second. I'm going to call just for a vote on the amendment. In favor? Opposed? Abstentions? That item carries. Now the item as amended is before us. Do I need to read it? Are we all set on this item? Are you all set? All in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? The item carries. Thank you, Chief. All right, as I noted in my opening comments, the Board of Education did contact me earlier through the superintendent and tell me that they had a meeting that was running a bit long. They asked if we could push their item in the agenda. If I see no issues there, I'm going to move along right to item number three, which is to hear, consider, and act upon a request from the CFO to transfer $10,795 from the general contingency fund to the registrar of voters' budget 
for the forthcoming special election. This is a result of the recent election. Do you have a, a motion to put this before us? Mr. DeWitt, second by Mrs. Marmion. The item is now before us. Um, Mr. Mayor, I think to start this item before I turn it over to board members, I'd like a general accounting of where we stand with the general contingency fund at this point. The number's in there, and remember, you gotta press the button. Yeah, I don't remember. I think it's a $300,000 for the general amount. Nothing's been uh, taken out. So there's been nothing taken out of that fund not, yet? Thanks. So anything related to the fill pile has been taken from yeah. prior years? We, it's, we Well, we spent prior year, and everything from this year is out of that uh, a portion of that $1.8 million. We've only spent 200000 Right. So there's nothing other than allocated. So if we allocate this 10000 Plus this 141, we will have expended before snow season 50%. half of the contingency. Right. Right. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Okay, I'll turn it over. Are the registrars going to come up and speak to this? Is that? Uh, yes, they are. Welcome, gentlemen. Please press the button and state your names. It says push. Steve Elworthy, Red Star Voters. And Matt Wagner. Hello. So go right ahead. Step us through your budget for this. So um, we need to uh, have four districts covered. That would be Fairfield Woods, which is District 3. Roger Ludlow, which is District 8, and um, District 10, Mill Hill, and Sherman, those four districts. So, by law, we need a minimum of four moderators. We need two assistant registrars, one from each party at each location. Checkers, uh, minimum is four, Val Kirk's four, Fabulator Tenor's four, and the AB Counters, two. And these are the rates that we pay them, have been paying them now for I think it's two years and you, you want to go to the back sure. okay uh, the remaining items on here we uh, talked to all of our vendors that we use and got quotes uh, so these are our firm targets for what these things will cost um, we're assuming a 50% turnout uh, as for our uh, ballot purchase and uh, beyond that those numbers are just uh, facilitating the accessible voting system, um, memory card programming, and, and other things that we do to run the election. So your ballots, the 8,300 is 50%? That's 50% with uh, some overage for our um, testing procedures and other things. So how many, what percentage voted in the last state rep race? Just so we know, we don't want a situation as other towns have had where we don't have enough ballots. Yeah. Uh, the last regular state rep race was uh, concurrent with the gubernatorial and U.S. Senate election, so um, uh, higher, uh, somewhere in the 70% range for that. Uh, the last special election, which is what we're using as a guideline, turned out was about 25%. And what was it? Did we have a state rep race without a gubernatorial race, and what was it then? Uh, the only time I can think of that that has happened was that there was once a special election for state representative concurrent with a municipal for st selectman race, okay. and that was also under 50 percent. Well, uh, wait, closer to but, 50. The, but the state rep races are, are every two years, correct? Uh, generally, yes. And governors every four years? Also correct. Right. But I guess the second state rep race is at concurrent with a presidential is that why you're not using that i'm trying to get to in a regular state rep race without gubernatorial what's the typical turnout but i think it goes with a presidential so it might not be yeah, right it would, it would be in the 80 for that right exactly so so the last special you were at 25 percent. so you doubled that at 50 percent so, so what happens if you run out of ballots uh in general what happens uh if you run out of ballots, you, uh, we monitor the ballot supply throughout the day. Um, we 
and we have the option of either uh, once it appears that we're likely to run out of ballots, either to contact our vendor to deliver more to us, uh, which is a possibility, um, or uh, make photocopies and have people insert their ballots in the box, be hand counted. Uh, for an election like a presidential or gubernatorial, that's a lot of races. For this, the hand counting is very simple. So it's only uh, going to be one uh, race on the ballot. Board members, questions? We'll go to Ms. Marmy first. Do you have any plans to um, uh, alert the voters, do a mailer, a card of some sort, uh, letting them know about the special election, the date, et cetera? We haven't talked about that. I was actually thinking about that might be a possibility today, but I don't know what the last one. This would be one district. Um, we did find, by the way, that that one was helpful. That was Sorry. The last one that went out for this past election was very helpful to people. I mean, I, I wouldn't be against it, I think. But if we'd have to get back to you on the cost, I don't know it all. It's, it's only one district or one state representative assembly. Local. Yeah. We got it. Um, I would also say that um, we have already scheduled a mailing for first week of January alert people to deadlines as to the upcoming party registration dates for primaries. Uh, our, our sort of biggest voter complaint is showing up at the polls thinking that there are, people are eligible to vote in primaries and finding out that they're not. So we put that in our budget this year. Uh, it may be possible to adapt that mailing um, in, in like the address block for people who are eligible to vote in the state representative election to put a line that, you know, you also are eligible to vote on such and such a date uh, for state representative. So um, I assume that the candidates themselves will probably uh, be putting word out pretty aggressively, but um, we did not put money in this proposal before you to do a separate mailing to 132nd district voters. Um, we could certainly put that number in front of you uh, for this meeting or, or the next one, um, but I think it may be a better option or a no additional cost option just to adapt to the mailer we're already planning to do in January. I mean, I think that's a great idea. I'm just concerned that people may not have the level of awareness about this special election that they might have had for the last special election, for example, or just because it's kind of, uh, so I would, I would love to see what you can do with your existing mailer so we can save some money, but on the other uh -huh. hand, if it's cost efficient to do a second mail or if it's not exorbitant, I'd be interested in seeing those costs as well. Mr. Walsh, you had your hand up. In regards to the poll workers' food, is the quantity for five, is that the five different locations, the four voting locations at headquarters? Oh, he's asking about the, the food. Um, yeah, we, we also, um, we have about as many people working in the office between absentee ballots and those of us who are there uh, full day uh, as a normal polling place. So basically headquarters is the Town hall, that's right. Mr. DeWitt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, are there absentee ballots included in your numbers or is Ms. Brown, Mrs. Brown? So is this, are we gonna hear from Mrs. Brown for an up, you know, up, up on her budget? You, you may, uh, she may find that, um, I would imagine it would be on the order of uh, low hundreds, 100 to $200, likely the cost. So uh, she may be able to absorb that, but you'd have to speak with her uh, to get a, you know. I mean, that is her office to, to, to buy absentee ballots. That's right, yeah. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? This is LeClaire. Um, I was just wondering, um, Because of the fact that um, we had a change in our deputy, the deputy resigned to, he got a job, brought on a new, a new deputy, a new deputy, and the, um, she has not um, 
worked that much since, and she also worked election day. So um, there's a little extra there as far as, because uh, they get 5,500 for the year, and we're right now, I believe, uh, 3,200. Um, but there are other things for her to do going forward. Other, other required. Anybody else? Seeing none, I'll call this item for a vote. Uh, the item is to transfer $10,795 from the general fund contingency to the Registrar of Voters budget for the forthcoming special election. All in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you, gentlemen. All right, seeing that there's no one from the Board of Ed here yet, I'm going to go on the item. Oh, okay. Please, come on up. I did not see you. Welcome. We're going to hear from the Board of Education to hear, consider, and act upon a request from the CFO to transfer $141,768 from the general fund contingency to the BOE budget for cost to move and retrofit the BOE's new maintenance facility in Bridgeport. Go right ahead. You, you need to hold the microphone. Good evening. First, let me start by apologizing. I believe there may have been a wrong version of the breakdown sent out to you guys, listing a price of approximately one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. It was it, it was corrected. It was the new okay. one was sent out. Sent so you'll see the new ones in this book that we put together for you. Um, a lot of this you've seen before. I don't believe you've seen is the last page, which is the breakdown of the cost. So the biggest expense here is fiber and architectural service. Correct. The fiber, architectural services, and then the uh, actual Myers movers. Right. Well, the architectural services just seems high. What are you doing in that place? Uh, it's, just, it's really actually not that advanced. It's just a kind of a build out. The, uh, the fact that it is in Bridgeport, we have to go for full permitting and fire marshal review. And so we did need a full set of building schematics to be able to present to the city of Bridgeport. That's where it does. And it also, not only does it cover the architectural services, but it also co covers inspections, any updates, changes. An A2 survey was added to it as well because the city of Bridgeport requested it because of a uh, fire department easement on the property. And what's with fiber? Why is that so expensive? The fiber price is up there because of the fact that we have a five-year, where all the schools now are connected fiberly, but it was done with a five-year plan. So we paid it out over the five years to move the fiber to make the buses able to run out, the bus transportation office able to run out of there. We can't advertise that over the five years, so we had to do it at an upfront cost. And it's been reduced, but not to the point of low numbers, unfortunately. Are we saving operating expense going forward by moving that in here? We're saving operating expenses by moving transportation over there because currently the uh, s the building that they are in is a uh, very it's it's about an 18 year old uh, portable classroom that was moved from Osborne when the annex was put up and it was actually used when it was moved into Osborne so the building is in very bad condition at this point there's um a bill there's an issue with the heating we're currently using small electric baseboard heats to keep them running where they are right now. We have an estimated cost of between eleven and twelve thousand dollars to get just the heating back up to where it needs to be. So we're saving the money on that and we're moving the transportation offices into the maintenance. We are doing that, yes. Okay. Other questions? Mr. Walsh. The transportation building that potentially would need to be number 
write up of 149,700. Is that a portable? Yes, that would be to replace in kind with a new portable building, not a brick and mortar. Kind of goes to the district trying to get rid of portables. Yes. Excellent. So, in a way, just the replacement of the portable, $149,700, that's insulation and everything. Yes, dropped in place on the existing footings and that the, are there now. The $11,000 for the new heater would be $160,000. Correct. And that would be due short. Uh, that's currently, if we were to stay, we would have to do it right away. Okay, right away. So that's less than the cost of the updates, construction, and move, and all that other stuff. Correct. Right there. Correct. And currently, on the building you're at right now, which is owned by the Ju one of the Julian companies. Correct. You're paying $31.12 per square foot. Correct? What's the contractual rate at the asterisk? Looking at your letter dated. Yes, so currently we are paying to 1556 a square foot. Mm -hmm. However, as we are on a month to month at our current location in the lease that we are currently on it says when we go to a month to month to month the owner of the property the landlord has the uh, has the ability to double our rent which is why you see the asterisk with the 3112 at the bottom and you're on month to month now we are we've been on month to month since July 1 still charging 1556 or 31000 he is. He continues to, to charge us to 1556. Is this a situation where he sends you a bill every month, or, or are you just sending him $15.50 per foot? We are continuously paying the monthly fee. We haven't received anything from him to say otherwise, so we okay. have not changed it at this point. Okay. So technically, on these things, you could, he could call you in default and go back and rebill you $0.31 cents Correct. at any point in time that he Correct. And you looked at places in Fairfield? We did. We used uh, Angel Real Estate, and we did a full evaluation of Fairfield. We looked at Bridgeport. We looked at Trumbull. We looked at Westport. We did all surrounding areas. We felt that this was over the line into Bridgeport, but close enough where it suits our needs. It'll make some of our travel time less to some of the schools because it's directly on the post road. Spaces you were looking in Fairfield, were they more expensive? They were much more expensive. Double? Uh, off the top of my head, I would have to say yes. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me. Okay. But to f double in rent, but also to find a, s a building that was the square footage that we were looking for, would not, we could not find anything that was 13,000 square foot commercial space in the town of Fairfield. That's in this particular area, the building that we're moving into used to be a used to be Mohawk cabinet. So it's actually set up with a wood shop and office space. So again, it's a very minimum build out. And the reason for the build out would be just so we can get transportation over there as well. When I look at this, it seems like this cost savings alone, especially with what you could be paying if you chose another. You find anything cheaper? We could not. We found. Uh, up the road slightly further into Bridgeport, we, we got into the range of approximately $10 a square foot, which is why we asked the landlord of the place of 3400 Fairfield Avenue to reduce what they were asking square footage, and they accepted the offer. Okay. So we, the lo location we found, which was lower in square footage and in price, was also not con conducive to what we do. They had eight foot rock ceilings as opposed to this one has 12 foot in some areas and it's wide open rooftop so for a wood shop it makes it much more more workable so that's why we went back to the building owner and asked if they would be willing to honor the price that we had found in other locations and you are also saving the four fourteen hundred dollars per month for the current storage fee Correct. We currently lease from Myers Movers a two 18-wheeler trailers that house storage for us, that we'd be able to get rid of those trailers, move them into our Ward High School, which is where our central storage location is, 
the intent is to move our central stores location, which is the location that ships custodial supplies and materials out to all the schools into this building as well. How long are you planning? How long is this? The cost, the lease we're entering into is a 10 year lease with a 10 year renewal. So already, if you stayed at your current look, say that wasn't even possible. Over the 10 years, you'd be paying $160,000 storage fee. Correct. All of that can go toward the price for the Yes, we're able to move, consolidate everything into that lease. And I saw on part of your write-up you stated that um, I think it was your concern that at the maintenance facility there wasn't monitoring, people there to monitor, right, that, that if you have this centralized look, so basically be people there to, to monitor the location fully manned. Correct. We're fully manned. We have a secretary that works out of Meadow Street now, so she'll be able to move over there. Mm -hmm. We have central stores location, which is one gentleman who's currently located underneath ward. So when he's not available, phones ring, no one answers. He's a, at least now, if a school has an issue and needs to get a hold of someone, they can call out to over there and get someone right away on the phone. Right. This seems like a great plan. Finding this. Seems like a no. Anybody else? Mr. Brown. Question on the question on the Julian Enterprise. Once we move out, I don't know how the lease, but could they come back to us for costs or any costs in regards to that building? Um, unfortunately, I think that would be a question for Stanton Lesser. I've looked through the lease. I don't. I'm not a lawyer, but I don't see anything they can come back to us for. We will, we've given them the proper notification. It says in the lease that we have to give them 30 days notice before we vacate. And uh, the town has actually made that notification. Stanton has done that. Mr. Matola. Um, thank you. What, so when, when, what's the game plan to move into this building? Uh, the lease that we have just finalized says that we will get occupancy of the building December 1st so we can perform our build outs uh, that is a month without a lease without rent payments but we can work in there and then January 1 we take on we take occupancy with our staff and that's when the lease fully kicks in and the month to month rent is due so, so you're vacating number first the old building I'm sorry, no, we're, I, we're vacating the old building dis December 31st. 31st, I'm yes. sorry. Yes. Okay. And I'm not going to ask you questions about the lease. You, um, it, it's, it's just quickly, it's a 10-year lease, correct? Correct. You mentioned already. 10-year lease with a option for a 10-year renewal. All right. And there some requirement in the lease that are responsible for paying some type of property taxes lease there is the lease that we the lease that we are we have signed now is a it's a standard commercial lease so we're paying the ten dollars ten twenty five I believe a square foot plus triple net costs included in the triple net costs is the tax property taxes for forty two percent of the building which is what we will be occupying we are uh, down the road, we were told that we could approach the city and ask for a waiver on that, but at this point, we have not done that yet. Okay, and just to be clear, this may be a good deal, but it, it is going to cost the Board of Ed more money going forward than if had you stayed in the older. Is that a fair statement? It is. It's going to increase our monthly costs a bit because it is double the size I mean if it was the same size as where we are now it would not the fact that it's double the size it is going to increase our monthly costs however by able to move transportation over there and our central stores location over there we're combining three services under one roof good thank you very much Anything else thank you did we have to uh, provide a security deposit to Julian when we leased the current uh, location? 
Um, unfortunately, I wasn't here at that time. That was a question that was brought up, and we are looking into it. To, re to recover it, if so. Mr. Mayor, do you know? You. Correct. I do not. All right. Anybody else? Seeing none, I'm going to call for a vote to approve the transfer of $141,768 from the general fund contingency to the Board of Education budget per cost to move and retrofit the Board of Ed's new maintenance facility in Bridgeport. All in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? The item carries. Thank you. There, there is nothing in the lease, though, that references. Say it again. There is nothing in the current Julian lease that references anything. Got process. it. Thank you. Good luck with your project, and thanks for the hard work. All right. Item number four. To hear, consider, and, or to re consider and recommend for approval an update on the Senior and Disabled Tax Relief Ordinance from the RTM Senior and Disabled Tax Relief Committee as reviewed and edited by the Board of Finance Senior and Disabled Tax Relief Subcommittee. I'm going to turn this over to the subcommittee's chairman, Mr. DeWitt, and ask what your intentions are here tonight of the board, Mr. DeWitt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as, as you all know, um, Ms. Marmy and Mr. Walsh and I are, in, are holding committee meetings for the Board of Finance Senior and Disabled Tax Relief. Um, and to be, to any changes that, um, that will affect this next year's tax bills, I mean, in a positive way for the uh, seniors or disabled um, eligible, have to be enacted by February. Uh, it was very clear to us last month, two months ago, that we were not going to be finished with our subcommittee by that time. So um, Representative Vergara, who, who offered to be here tonight, and we told her, Please stay home. I think we can handle this. Um, went to her RTM board and said, "Listen, there's a couple of things that are very important to help our our most desperate needs needed, actually disabled um, residents, and the changes are as they're shown here. Uh, just so everyone's clear, these changes were um, approved. Well, I'm sorry, they were recommend officially recommended by the RTM." Senior and Disabled Tax Relief Committee, and they have been reviewed by the tax assessor, and he agrees with the changes. And it's well, um, it's it's um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's agreed upon that this is a positive change to the ordinance, and we're voting on it tonight just to get it in time for the February tax deadline. So, so what I so and you Step ask us what you want me to do, right? So, so Chris, let me let me ask two questions. Sure. Number one, I'd like you to step us through the changes, but number two, are you saying that this is an interim step, and that the committee's work is not done? And the committee will continue, and there'll be additional adjustments to the senior citizen tax relief and disabled tax relief program moving forward. That that is correct. As we were told by um, Mr. Lester's town attorney, any changes to this ordinance must be initiated by the Board of Finance, which is what we're doing tonight. It'll then go to the Board of, uh, I'm sorry, it'll then go to the RTM for their approval and the update of the ordinance. That's why this is before us tonight. But you're saying that you're not done with your work. We are not done with our work. We will, you'll, you'll be hearing more from us. Okay, so you're going to continue and then go back to the Board of Finance, to the newly constituted Board of Finance. That's right. And then back to the RTM at a later date. That's correct. Okay, do you know when that date will be? <laughs> I'd like to say I know that. I'm thinking probably February time frame. And that will be for changes that will take place in 2021. No, so the good news is that the changes that we're proposing can act actually do not have to be uh, implemented before February. They can be implemented, oh, they only have to be implemented before the tax bills go out the door. So they could be recommended through our board and through the RTM um, up until June. So we have a little bit of time. Okay, but these changes. But this couldn't be. These are the 
high priority ones that need to be part of the tax calculation prior to the budget discussion. That's correct. Anybody have any other questions on this? Mr. Walsh? Some of this had to be sped up West, at the request of our assessor, Mr. Murray, so that when the program starts going into effect February 1st, they can back. people can properly make That was one of the reasons this provision up. This provision is also um, one I learned about from being on this case. It was kind of draconian. Um, the federal government under IRS allows deductions of medical expenses of 7.5%. And the reason they do that is they consider that to be catastrophic. If you have expenses above 7.5% of your income, that it's pretty much almost catastrophic. There was a recent, and, and there's a woman who happens to be in a crowd and brought this all to our attention, Holman, don't mind me calling you out, um, but brought this to our attention. And he qualified before. Because the previous assessor interpreted this definition differently than the current assessor. Now, I'm not saying what the current assessor is doing is the wrong way. It was just the way it was written. And Mr. Lesser gave a different opinion, probably a more accurate opinion, now, to be honest with you, with the words that were written here on how it would, would be applied. But the previous assessor said if you hit the 30% threshold, all of your medical expenses were deductible. Now, when the change came, people who were qualifying before, you only got dollar one after 30%. So you'd had this catastrophic event where if people are disabled, they have this catastrophic event every single day that they're alive and services that they need. So it came to us, it became apparent that why wouldn't we follow the IRS rule? And it will change. Whatever the IRS rule is, so just talk about raising that up slightly. But whatever the IRS rule is, we'll follow the same. So that's kind of the background. And because we need the application to start being filed on February 1st, and because this has to go to the IRR, uh, because any change has to go to the RTM committees for two months on any change of any type of code, we need to speed this up right away. So we are not done with our work which sometimes feels like a full-time job, but we can continue on doing something. It does. It does. And I tell you, Mr. DeWitt presented some spreadsheets to you that I don't think I'd seen in my finance days in 1986, pages and pages of spreadsheets that rolled onto spreadsheets that had all sorts of calculations and uh, whatever, but uh, it did an amazing job with it. So anyway, so that's the reason kind of why we're here and kind of why we want to make it. Okay. Um, because we always called it a senior disabled tax relief, which we still want to do, emphasize a little bit more the disabled because tendency to always call it senior tax relief. And I think the disabled in this population seem to be a little insulted that it's not really called what it really is um, properly. And um, that's, that's, that's what this is. Mrs. Marmin, do you have anything to add since you were on the committee? No, I, I would agree with everything that's been said and I, I, um, I think we should we should support this most definitely and I would just say that it has been a process looking at the overall ordinance and working in conjunction with uh, Jill Vergara and her committee they did a lot of work we're building on it I think we're getting there uh, but the the further we go the more we realize that we could spend we truly could spend our, our this could be a full-time job um, so but I think we've made a lot of progress I really do. Um, so, and I, I think what we've kind of come to a conclusion with is that the process itself, in terms of now the Board of Finance having to look at this first, once we get to a point where we have an ordinance to look at, I think we need to look at the process because it kind of went backwards. The RTM did the work, then they came to, then it came to us, then we're interfacing with them and making sure that what we're recommending makes sense but perhaps moving forward we tweak that process a little bit so that it's a little bit more um, efficient. And that's my perspective. Thanks. And Mr. Matola. This could be an unfair question. So do you think once you're done with your work that this will be something for two years, 
three years, six months? Is it something you're, you're always going to have to be involved with? I mean, what's your thoughts about that? Me personally? Not you, <laughs> but, but someone. Because we had this discussion last night, frankly. Um, I, I think Mar uh, Mrs. Marmion brought up a fair point, right? We're, you know, this is the first year that the Board of Finance is looking at this. And then, you know, so, so we kind of did it backwards. Their team did a bunch of work, and then we're doing a bunch of work. Um, when, when you see our out brief, I think you're going to find that we've, um, we're going to some, introduce some tools that will help the next um, committee a little, you know, predict a little more. Still need a tax assessor, and he's been fantastic. I mean, he turns around stuff in like 24 hours. It's really great. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know that we need to look at it every two years, to be honest with you, but four years, yeah. I mean, we're also going to be putting things in place where COLA changes will be automatically instituted. So, you know, you don't have to change that, that income cap from 17,100 to 17,123 through, through an amendment generated by the Board of Finance. But good question. Thank you. To that, is there a discussion then of actually changing sort of that sunset provision that every two years is going on this time around and to, to move it to four or and in the end to that end to the direct question right the board of finance no matter what has to be involved so our team throws in well, I'm gonna two years and the term is added again and then the board of finance kind of over and over again there's been uh, no formal recommendation made for sure, and not actually there hasn't even been any discussion about how, how frequently we should do this. But um, again, uh, Mr. Lesser wrote an opinion, and that's the current opinion that, that I have to work with, that says that any change to this ordinance has to be initiated by the Board of Finance. So if the Board of Finance, if, if the RTM in two years says, hey, I think we should change this, and we look at it and say, I don't think so, it, it doesn't get changed. It has to be initiated from this board. Now, um, I don't want to put a, something in place like that where we're in charge of this thing, right? But um, it, the next wave of, of change should be done collaboratively. Have a one or two RTM. I guess, I guess what it comes down to is, and the answer is, there might be tweaks going forward for a number of years, but maybe not a wholesale rewrite, where this was really a bottoms-up scrub from the RTM and from this board. And then you go back, you get it to a point where you put in these triggers, these calculations, and then the next time it might be another tweak, but it might not. Right? Is that a fair? Yeah, that's, that's fair. I also think we, somebody has to assess on how it's going. I mean, how many people are using this program or these programs and how much it's, you know, what the town is paying or right. in terms of tax revenue. So I, I do think that that's the most important thing that whatever board look or whatever committee looks at moving forward is what is the true impact of these changes. And they could be great. They could be, you know, alarming. I, I don't know. Or they could be ineffective. So that, I think that's, that's very true. That's yeah. what I would be most concerned with. And that was one of our points when this originally came before us, is what are we trying to achieve and how do we measure success? And it really wasn't clear. So you're absolutely right. Ms. Sesma, I don't come to Mr. Walsh. Thank you. So the, the sign-up period is still the same. It's by May, I believe, that uh, seniors and disabled... I don't remember. Mayor, do you remember? Is the sign-up period through May? May? It starts uh, February 1st. And then through May. May. And, and this will be included. And is there any, did you guys discuss any different approach to outreach to notify seniors of any changes or to capture more? I mean, I think we've noticed that there is not full participation. Um, well, we, we, we have, so we went to uh, the senior center in, uh, two separate times and polled a lot of seniors and got a lot of good um, a lot of good results back and I'll tell you what the senior center is the best propagation of this program um, seniors can go there there's people from the tax department that will fill the paperwork out for them 
Um, they can call up the tax department and people will come to their house. I mean, this is, this is pretty well run, right? Um, there was a recommendation made, and it's, it's, it's kind of outside the purview of, of our committee, but, uh, you know, last year's tax bills could have had a little note in there and said, hey, don't forget about senior tax relief. Everybody gets one. I mean, if you're getting a tax bill and you're a senior, you could be eligible. It's not, it's not a big focus, but, one, but I will tell you, and we just voted on this last night, that, there, there is, um, that we're going to write into the ordinance that every June, rather than the tax assessor just coming to the RTM to brief him, he's going to come to, he or she will come to the Board of Finance. Good. Mr. Walsh? I will say um, it, they don't know the reasons why people tried everything almost humanly possible. Um, people, as they get older, sometimes something happens to them family them and either maybe puts them into a nursing home, maybe moves them closer to them or moves them in, and they just leave and no one knows why they didn't reply the name. The house still seems to be in their name for probably because they're going to get it ready for sale or something else, but they call, they actually call the people to try to find them and, you know, sometimes have knocked on doors, go through the senior center, they go, there's all sorts of ways through social services. I, mean, I could not find one thing that I could think about that they weren't already doing. So they don't seem to leave things, un seem to try to find, um, they don't leave a stone unturned. It's just that I, I guess as people get older, there's just something happens sometimes in people's lives. You know, they try to track the people who died, take them off the list, okay, so whatever. But, you know, there's reasons why as people get older, Things, their situation changes. They go in for a, you know, a hospital appointment, it turns into something bigger, and they're in a nurse. They don't do anything with the house for a while. Or they just sell the house. All right. Ms. Marmion. I just want to build on that for one second, which is one of the, one of the purposes of what we're doing here is we're trying to, I believe, keep people in Fairfield. I mean, that's, you know, make it, make it affordable for them to stay in Fairfield. And I think that's what I'm interested in discovering is does this program make a difference in terms of enabling them to yeah, stay in Fairfield? Exactly. And so in terms of figuring out not only, you know, why do you or do you not apply, it's really does this or does not this not make a difference? And if we can get to that, that's not through us obviously, but if there's some sort of questionnaire or, or a formal way of surveying folks who participate, that's what I would be interested in, in getting that data you know, once this program is implemented. Thank you. In that regard, I will say the committees, three of us are lockstep in wanting to the most people to see whether it will have an effect. So we are actually pushing money downward, lower end, try to, uh, try to see whether it helps. Zero to $18,000 income range, we really can't live here. And this change is specifically driven for the, our disabled so, constituents yeah. too, right? So let's get back to what's before us just because I want to be cognizant of yep. it. So what you, what you have before us is the change relative to the medical, the medical expenses that Mr. Walsh spoke to. That's right. And tying it to the IRS code and getting rid of any ambiguity so that we don't have issues as residents have had in the past. And this is the change that's urgent or the February date, and then you'll go on and do the additional changes and recommendations. That'll go back before the RTM. Is that fair? That is accurate. Does anybody have any questions related to this specific change? Mrs. LeClaire's hand is already up. Tax accountant. Here's my question. Um, the tax Many of our seniors can no longer item because of And so what my question is that all within that, that range, um, if married file and joint thousand. Um, but if so if they don't go over that amount, they have quite a lot of medical not itemized. Are we accounting for that? 
or have they don't experience they I have no idea. Well, I feel all warm and fuzzy right now. <laughs> I just, I just want to be clear. That's that's a that's a CPA question, and uh, I, I oh, <laughs> essentially what essentially what Mary's saying is, if you don't qualify for additional deductions relative to the standard, just take the standard deduction. Then this excludes you partake in. I mean, does that does that become income? I can say that, wait a minute here, Mary, is it, is it practical to think that somebody's going to have over 30% of their income go to medical deductions, plus have to pay all their other taxes and not qualify for being above the standard deduction? I would think by definition if over 30%, I understand where you're going and I agree, but if over 30% of your income is going towards medical, you automatically aren't filing the standard. No? Maybe that's an erroneous assumption. I'm like, yeah, I mean, the uh, standard deduction is now like 24. That's, that's yeah. right. So, I mean, in this, and you could have a very low income here. You could have $50,000 income. For Do they, what does that do to what they can deduct from their personal property tax or from their property tax? Because they already qualify. If they have that low income, they already qualify anyway, correct? Yeah, then, well, if they have that low income, then they're obviously they're not paying big state income taxes. So, well, that, that, so the salt is not having an impact. Right, but what I'm saying is don't they qualify anyway without medical requirement? Just by definition of... It, Mary's posed a, a very important question. I get it. Yes. But what I'm saying is, if you're making, if that thir if you're spending thirty percent of your income, and you're saying, hey, it's twenty four thousand dollars, but that'd only be somebody seventy some odd thousand dollars. Right. Don't they qualify anyway by definition of the fact that they're only making seventy thousand? In other words, aren't we covering that bracket? Well, what we're not doing is taking into account medical expense because the medical expense will be folded in that 20. So would we give them even more? That's, that's the question. Mary's asked, opened up a Pandora's oh, box, so to speak, here. Even more deduction, or they only get the deduction once, right? Correct. And this is to decide whether they qualify for the deduction, correct? Correct. So in order to hit this 24000 in order for the 24,000 to be 30 percent, right, which is what we're talking about here, you would be closer to like 70 some odd percent. Based on the ceiling that you have, you're already there, so you probably qualify regardless of cost. The, the income Excuse me, the benefit is based upon your adjusted gross income, right? So if you... Yeah, I mean, that's correct, but, I'm, but I guess what I'm, what I'm questioning my head is now, there's, it's, it's the intent of this change. There, there's a disabled component here, right? So you could be, you could qualify because you're 65 and over, or you could qualify because you're disabled. And that, and it, the, you still, you're still in, you still have the imposition of the, um, of the income cap, which is, which is, much here. If you do the math, it's, it, it falls within that seventy thousand dollar range, right? That's my point. You guys have already said if you're within the seventy thousand dollar, whatever it is, range, right? Plus, 
plus you're either disabled or over 65, you qualify for the deduction. Yeah, the, we, we, I mean, we should ask Mr. Murray for, for sure, but I, I think the answer to the question is you're, you're not double dipping. You're, 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 already, you're already eligible based on age, your Q, the QTAV, and then your income if it's under 70,000, some number, right? Right, exactly. Well, the, the likelihood is you were talking about people making sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year, you know, right? So twenty four thousand dollar deduction is like twenty five, thirty percent of that number, right? So and what is this says if it's seven and a half percent is is the is the, so if you're and if you're making eighty thousand dollars, you're not paying big state income tax, you're not Paying your and your property taxes is is not going to be. I mean, unless you based upon what's what's the house. <clears throat> you're, you're probably not paying big. You're not paying twenty thousand dollars in property tax. So, I think the standard deduction is covers lots of ills of it is I just think we should go back and run the math the scenarios but I think you're covered because of the the seventy thousand yeah. dollars right threshold up above yeah it's unlikely that you're gonna have that's my point right but I I haven't seen this scenario. I I don't even play a tax account on TV so I guess right now I I think that's got to be looked into, and it would be good if that was looked into before the RTM votes on it and adjusts it accordingly. Before they vote on this ordinance Just before? It was covered. Well, yeah. Actually, actually, better yet, it would be better if you called Mr. Murray and asked that question because well, I, I know I'm not going to ask the question. Mr. Mayor I mean, understands unless, that. Unless... Uh, you know, Mr. Mayor would be would be kind enough to convey that message. Do we have any other questions or comments on this item? Anybody from the public that wants to speak? Don't to let this Mary item? talk anymore. Go ahead. Mary's like the two-armed economist. On one hand, this; on the other hand, that. Hi, I'm Deborah Coleman. So I thank you. I brought this to, to the attention of the various committees working on this um, and I have thought about this, your question and a bit and have run some numbers myself so I'm not an expert I'm not on a committee but I think that especially given the um, what I saw the other night if the um, subcommittee for the Board of Finance and the move to try to push the benefits to the lower income brackets that that will offset any um, potential, you know, detriment to this issue of itemizing. Um, so it's a trade-off. If, if more money is pushed to the lower income brackets, then those people will be, comp not compensated, I don't know, uh, they will be covered. Whereas people who are maybe making, maybe have a higher income, but have a very large amount of their um, consumable income being, you know, spent on catastrophic or, you know, whatever medical expenses. They, um, they are the ones that are most likely to itemize. I mean, right now it's only about 10% of people who itemize um, since the tax code changed. Before it was maybe 30%. Um, I, I th am very much in favor of this because right now the way that the ordinances are code, it's um, very hard to meet the, the, the threshold at all. So in fact, this is already better than what is there because to reach the threshold of 30% and then only have each dollar above that count is produces such absurd results that if I were to explain them to you, you would, you know, your heads would blow off because you would have to be making so much money 
to have it e even make a difference. I mean, and even for the lowest brackets, for every 1% of medical expenses above the 30%, you would only see a reduction in your income of about $160. It doesn't, that, that, what's in the, co the code or ordinance now is really, um, it, it, as interpreted, newly interpreted, it produces just ridiculous results. It's, it's virtually useless. So I would say this is, a, is very much an improvement it's in, and is in step with many towns in the area. Many towns use this exact same criteria uh, for the medical deduction. So I, I, I mean, it, it is, you know, there are trade-offs always, certainly, um, but for people with catastrophic um, illnesses or disabilities who are most likely to claim, to, to itemize, or even who might decide, look, knowing of the ta senior tax relief program, and the disabled tax relief program, they might say, well, let's file separately, you know, uh, so that we do itemize. You know, there's, you might decide to itemize even if you were going to fall a little short of the 24000 because you could then come to the town with an itemized tax return. I think there are lots of ways to slice, slice up that pie, but I do think it's a huge improvement over what we have now and the way that it was in, interpreted, then reinterpreted, then interpreted which was a mess and created, wasted a lot of time for the assessor and hurt a lot of people. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to call this item for a vote. In the interim, is there any change to the asset um, requirements or limitations? We are not making any recommendations. For the, 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 that will come, but That's right separate now. from this. Oh, QTAV is, well, no, we're not making any of the recommendations. All right, so before us is an interim step on changing the senior citizen tax relief policy, senior citizen and disabled tax relief policy, so that we can roll this out before February 1st through the RTM. Any questions, comments, concerns from board members? Seeing none, I'm going to call for a vote to recommend this item to the RTM as recommended by our subcommittee. All in favor? Opposed? Abstention? That item carries. And let me say thank you to our members for all their hard work. Uh, that is a thankless and brutal effort, but uh, I'm sure by your efforts it's going to have uh, great benefits to the town. So thank you. Ms. Coleman's going to buy us all beers when we're done. No, I'd like to echo your statements, Mr. Chair. In fact, I think the direction of where they're going, where it's uh, it's significantly different than what first came to this board by the RTM. Uh, it's more definable. It, it's more beneficial to lower income people. Uh, um, and uh, we can, you know, you can measure the participation changes, but one thing that's missing still is uh, the ability to really, and you guys have already said this, that is how, mu how well is it really working? What impact is it really having? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to move on to item number five, which is to approve the minutes of August 26th, September 3rd, September 25th, October 1st, October 21st, and October 29th. Someone put those before us, please. Matola, seconded by Mr. DeWitt. I'm going to take these in order because people that were absent don't want to vote on those. So first of all, all in favor of August 26th minutes? All opposed or abstentions? No one abstained or opposed. Uh, September 3rd minutes, all in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? Mrs. Marmion and Mr. Brown abstained. There were no opposition. September 25th, all in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? We have two abstentions. Ms. Esma and Mr. Walsh, that was October 1st. October. Oh, that was September 25th. My apologies. October, f September 25th. I goofed that. October 1st. All in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? We got Mrs. LeClaire, Mr. Brown, anybody else? 
Okay, so that's October 1st. October 21st, all in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? I abstain. I was not at that meeting. October 29th, all in favor? Opposed? Abstentions? That carries. Uh, the only communication that's uh, relevant, actually the only communication, not a direct communication, but the board had asked for follow-up on the, uh, the uh, transfer station containers, and we did get the bids in this week. And the bids range from a low of uh, $287,000 to a high of $617,000. Uh, there seems to be limited interest on uh, people accepting the... Uh, Current containers is trade in, uh, ten thousand dollars each. We paid fifty four. Uh, I talked to Brian Carey today and asked him to uh, talk to uh, the board of ed, see if they could be uh, repurposed, as I know we, we we might be using similar kind of equipment that we're renting at the high schools. But I don't know that for a fact, so that's what I'm checking. Is we might get some savings through repurpose. What did we expect to get? As as bids. Uh, I think like in the uh, 300 to 350 range. Yeah, the uh, yeah the the interesting the the big one uh, the high one is uh, which is 50 percent higher than the second uh, is from the ones we bought the uh, the original ones that we're dumping from. Got it. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions comments on this item? Seeing none, it's that time of the evening where uh, some of us take our leave of this board. So I'm going to go to Ms. Zesma and ask if she's got any comments as she exits the board. First of all, I want to thank you for your hard work and efforts. It's been a pleasure serving with you, and I wish you best of luck in future endeavors, as I know the whole board does. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure. I want to thank my colleagues for um, this experience. I have thoroughly enjoyed it, as I have all my years of public service and I know that I will return to a role uh, in public service at some point. And I think this board should take credit for um, great fiscal stewardship and oversight. We have a lot to be proud of over the past eight years. We have a tremendous balance sheet, many successes. And I do hope the board will move forward making those sound decisions in a truly bipartisan fashion. I also want to congratulate um, Jack and, and Lori, I'm very excited to have Lori Charlton um, sitting in this seat. And um, also to you, Tom, congratulations. And I know this is a big night for you to be leaving this role, but I wish you all the best. In, uh, and congratulations to you too, Mary. Didn't mean. Thank you very much. All right, we'll go over to David. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I really appreciate it. The opportunity to serve. So, is that better, Jerry? All right. No, I just I appreciate the opportunity that I've been I've been given over the last or to, to serve an elected office, and um, I am looking forward to more time evening side, but also continuing. I I, I like everybody else a lot of other areas serve publicly effort. I thank all of my colleagues. Welcome to the night. Thank you. David, so it's been great to serve with you. What's been real interesting is you were very young when you got on this board. And well yeah, compared to us. I know. Um, I went from twenty seven to thirty seven, so yeah, so it's, it's uh, crazy. you're almost like a little brother, but it's been amazing to watch you grow and how, uh, and what you've become on this board, and you'll be missed as we'll miss as my board. So uh, thank you for your service, and we look forward to your next act. Um, as for myself, wow, 14 years, 10 years as chairman. I was in Mr. Mayor's office the other day, and he showed me a document he put together when he left the board which was all of our accomplishments. 
which I will not recite this evening, but they are lengthy. And they are something we can all be proud of. For myself, I went from the birth of a son, death of parents, um, turning 50, all on this board. Pretty amazing. Um, I'm proud of our accomplishments. There's people that say the board won't be the same. It'll be better because they'll learn from our mistakes and you'll add to what we've accomplished. And I look forward to watching your success. Through 14 years, Mary is the only one to outserve me on this board. And she'll know all these names. Wally Flynn, Debbie Zeef, Kevin Kiley, Ken Brockfeld, Bob Stone, Rob Bolito, Kathy Albin. They all taught us things. And I take away from all of them and all of you quite a bit. And I thank you for that. Now, as I move on, I have a few things to say regarding final thoughts. Number one, don't ever let formality destroy your conversation. Have your arguments, have your fights, have your disagreements, have your fun. Let the conversations be open and free-flowing. You come to a better result. Two, don't let social media destroy this board. Don't let our disagreements spill over to behind the keyboards. Have them face-to-face. -face. Have them behind the back door. But have them together. Don't be afraid to disagree or ask the tough questions. Lastly, have fun and always do what you think is in the best interest of the time. That's the most important thing. So, finally, to the board as I leave. We had a horrible gavel that I used for the last 10 years. So I went out and procured this ugly red gavel that will hopefully fade over time and had it engraved as the Town of Fairfield Board of Finance. And I turned this over to the next chairman that they use it in good stead for the rest of the board, for the rest of their time, and that they pass it down for time and memorial to their successors. But I'm going to do the first thing. I broke it in. So now it will be somebody else's as we move forward. I thank you all for your friendship and for your good humor and for your confidence over the last 10 years. So, thank you. I'll have to get used to these microphones, Jerry. I kind of like not having to push a button, but what can we say? So, yeah, Liz, thank you. I'm in Dave. And it's been, um, Liz, I'm not, how long have you been on this board? It is two years and four months. Yeah. So thank you both for your contribution, your willingness to volunteer, all your insight, and everything that you, you know, you've done and helped us do. And I'm sure, you know, once you start volunteering, kind of gets in your blood, I'm sure you'll do something. Dave, thank you for all your help with Marcus. Sure, we'll see you at the RTC. Not giving everything up. Not everything. <laughs> Maybe politics, though. Capturing my time as much. All right, so thank, thank you both. Tom, it's been an honor to be your vice chair for right after Mr. Bolito uh, basically lost to Dave, right? So it was six, about six years or so. Um, it's been and we've learned a lot from you. Thank you for your leadership in general, specifically your financial leadership. Um, taking us through, we, we say this is going to be a tough budget season, but we say that every budget season. There's never an easy budget. Always challenging. And you've taken us, you know, you've led us through. Thank you. Not only budget seasons, but difficult projects. You know, Penfield twice, right? The first time wasn't easy. The second time was 10 times tougher. Led us through that, and we thank you for that. You've laid out priorities. 
you, you've made this board proactive, um, proponent of a strategic plan, move us forward amongst many other accomplishments. So I do thank you for everything that you contributed to this board, um, especially as chair for 10 years, vice chair for two. You're, even tonight, you say you don't play a tax accountant on, except for maybe on TV, but you, I mean, you, you take complex issues and you're able to articulate them, and that is something that we miss. You know, raised a bar, and it was really, because we know how much you enjoy this and enjoy being part of this board and chair of this board. So it was really a selfless act to run as a selectman uh, for the benefit of the town. Um, and you did it because people asked you to, and you did it for the benefit of the town. And the town rewarded you to be a selectman, and we look forward to working with you uh, in that capacity. Congratulations on that, on that win. And yeah, congratulations to Mary, Jack, Lori. We'll see you on February 26th, day after you, you're sworn in. November. What did I say? I'm looking forward to February, I guess. Yeah. I like the way you think, Jim. You're going to be a great chairman. <laughs> We're going to move these years pretty quick, okay? We're going to skip three months at a time. Show okay. up in March. We're gonna You'll be fine. Get the holidays. <laughs> okay, so we're November 25th. You're sworn in. November 26th, we'll be here for a court meeting. Yeah. So December 3rd is our organizational meeting. And I'm not sure um, Liz and Dave be around or Tom, but we'll have something for you if you are. If not, we'll make sure we get it to you. All right? So congratulations and good luck. And thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice Chairman. Anybody else have anything they want to say as we wrap up here this term? Mr. Walsh? How did I know, Mr. Walsh? I've never been short of words. Well, first of all, I'd like to um, thank Ms. Zesma for our time. I mean, um, I think we've um, sometimes stretched my mind, made me think of ways that I normally don't. And while we have not always agreed on certain issues, say we've agreed on 90% or more. So, so thank you for your time, and, and you know, and, and, and thank you for becoming a friend. Uh, I definitely welcome. To thank you very much, uh, David. Um, what could I say? Um, it's been a good 10 years. Uh, once again, you've been a, a friend. You've been someone I've been able to bounce ideas off of. But mostly, um, I don't know this, you were my treasurer during one of my runs for the Board of Finance, and I think we somehow, between you and I, raised $12,000 in about 10 days. Which kept it going, we could have run for the president. So anyway, so thank you for that. I'll, ne I'll, ne I'll never forget that, because you and I were in contact probably 25 times a day. And Tom, I don't know really where to start with you um, and how we're going to move on, to be quite honest with you part of the Board of Finance. Um, you have been the captain, the steady hand on the tiller. Um, you've had various roles in doing certain things, sometimes muzzling me. <laughs> um, other times, uh, you know, bouncing stuff off. I'll never forget all the times we bounced ideas. Um, it's going to be hard not having you on my left side. Meetings, I'm definitely going to uh, But I know you'll be here. And you'll be here during the budget season and quiet at the end of the table like the other <laughs> selectmen, right? New role. Uh, <laughs> so uh, thank you for your time and effort that you did to this board. You gave your heart and soul. It was like a full-time job to you. Um, and thank you for what you did. Jim had to bring up muzzling him as one of the things. It was, he starts with my failures. Oh. <laughs> All right, so that's it. Um, thank you, everybody. Good luck in the next term. Best wishes to our new colleagues on the Board of Finance. I wish you all the best. I hope you have half as much fun as I had sitting up here. You will thoroughly enjoy yourselves and your colleagues. Anybody else?
Seeing none, I'll call for a motion to adjourn for the last time. We'll take Ms. Desma and Mr. Becker. All in favor of adjournment? Opposed? Abstention?